Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 119. History lives on the tabletop. Great board games based on history. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight we have a question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons who's a big historical miniature war game fan who's looking to broaden their tabletop experience into the realms of board gaming. Also, somewhat loosely with sticking with this theme, we have a couple of detailed reviews of two Viking themed games. Well, technically one game and one expansion, but two Viking thing themes. Uh, Hall of Heroes for Raiders of the North Sea, and a game called Scora, which I found a very unique choice for theme on that one. An interesting look at Vikings that you don't normally see. Finally, we wrap up with our week in review where I've got, uh, we had our much smaller than normal gaming in the New Year party, and some first plays of Letter Jam and a physical plays of the crew. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Let's start off with some criticisms. Penelope commented on our more popular blog post, which highlights great two-player games for date night, to say, For your Fallout recommendation, it would be helpful to describe what the game is about. All right, fair point, Penelope. Uh, on the post, I talk all about how Deanna and I played the game like five times over one anniversary weekend spent out in Kingsville. And at the time, I think I was just assuming most people know what Fallout is and what Fallout would be about. The game was popular at the time. Everyone was talking about it on podcasts. But you know what? I didn't actually put anything in the post, what you do in the game or what Fallout is. So I've since gone and edited that post. So there's at least some indication there of what the game's actually about. Well, Sean, um, Patrick Shoot was not impressed by our website at all. They took the time to email this. I visited your website today for the first time and tried to use your search box on the right side. Non-functioning, to put it kindly. Tried searching for Splendor, Fort, and a few others. Nothing that came on the following pages was any use whatsoever. I'm always looking for games for gifts, but I will not be able to recommend your company webpage. You list deals, but the links take you to products that are more. Example, I purchased Ticket to Ride three days ago for $36 from Amazon. Now it's $43. All right. Well, we've said many times we want feedback, both positive and negative. So thanks for the email, Patrick. So starting off with the search issue. So we currently use WordPress's built-in search functionality. Like it literally comes with every WordPress site. And all I did was click a box on my sidebar to say, hey, put a search box here. And I got to admit, I haven't really used it that much myself. So I actually sat there and I searched the games Patrick mentioned, and I got to agree with them. The results are not what I expected to see. So for example, when I searched Splendor, the top hit was Star Trek The Next Generation card game where about the the Borg invasion, where I happen to mention that there's a lot of wasted space in that box, but not as much as Splendor. And that's the only time Splendor is mentioned in the whole thing. And that came up on the top post, over posts where I actually added a tag that said Splendor. So that's not cool. So that's something with WordPress. Like, why am I putting, I put a ton of tags on all of our posts thinking that that's probably how search is going to work. And it ends up that search doesn't actually use the tags and said it searches the content, which I don't, that seems confusing to me. So this is something we're definitely looking at. Uh, Deanna has been talking to Aaron, our webmaster, about solutions. Uh, what we've come up with so far looks like it's going to be very database heavy. So if you do have your search reference those tags, it has to make more tables or something. Again, she's the webmaster, not me. So we are working on that aspect. And I got to thank you for calling that out because it doesn't work the way I'd like it to either. Now, as for the deals, there's not a lot I can do about that one. I do assure everyone that goes to our pages or follows me on Twitter, looks at the pages on Facebook, that when the deals are posted, they are definitely live. I check them all. I don't just copy them from other sites. We physically go to the stores, check the price, then post it. What I can't guarantee is what happens after that. Some deals last weeks, some last months, but others only last minutes. Really hot deals, we do monitor, right? Uh, Game Nero's deal of the day. I don't tweet that out ever throughout the day because I know it won't last. And I'll check back after an hour to see if it's still live. But other stuff, I we can't. Like, it just, 
not physically possible for Dan and I to be constantly checking every price, say every hour, or every half hour, or even every day. Nothing on those pages is automated. It's all us. It's all Deanna and I manually updating all those lists. Now, there are other sites out there. I'm not going to call them out specifically, but there are a number of board game pricing sites out there, and they all use software to scrape sites like Amazon for prices. And you know what? We find those horribly unreliable. That's the reason we made our own site. We go there and you search a game and you click on the link and it brings you to a different game or it brings you to an expansion or it shows the this discounted price, but there's $80 shipping on top of it. This is why we made our page and why we think our curated lists are more value added than those scraping sites. Despite the fact that now and then there's gonna be a deal that sells out and we won't catch it right away unless someone points it out to us or we check it a day or so later. So I think we're doing the best we can. I don't think there's any way we can improve the deal searching to check for it. I don't know. Uh, it, unfortunately, stuff sells out. They're good deals. That's kind of what happens with a good deal. It's the same thing where you get your Zellers fire and by the time you go to the store, they're selling out of the item. It happens. And unfortunately, Amazon doesn't do rain checks. <laughs> no. Now, next up, Willen Kang isn't sold on the PIP system. They wrote to say it probably doesn't treat the supers theme very well, does it? The ultra powerful characters like the ones from Marvel and DC, where they can lift thousands of tons and throw punches that can level mountains or shatter planets. All right, well, thanks for the, the uh, comment, Wheeler. Uh, one of the best things about heavily narrative role playing systems like the PIP system is that they can handle things like this at all kinds of scales, like supers at of all types, right? Because the game is all about telling a story and presenting challenges, like the narrator, the, the DM, GM, presenting challenges to the characters, then having those characters describe how they overcome those challenges, and then using the mechanics to figure out a, like a task difficulty, right? And you can easily shift the scales of those challenges to suit the kind of game you're playing. So with supers and specifically, if you want to do a street level Hell's Kitchen, you know, uh, defenders kind of thing. A, a, a difficult challenge could be a lone mugger in an alley, an ally, sorry, getting him. And I can't said alley right the first time, and I <laughs> corrected myself. I, uh, sorry, you got a lone mugger in an alley, maybe with an ally, uh, and trying to get that mugger to surrender, maybe assign, say, a difficulty of two black dice in the PIP system. And then the character is going to look at their skills and go, well, I have intimidation. They're going to get a bonus die for that. At the opposite end, at a cosmic scale, a similar challenge level. So the exact same difficulty, mechanical difficulty of two black dice could be stopping a meteor fired from a rail gun from Pluto that's about to smash into Earth. And then instead of the character using their intimidation, they're using their power of an exploding sun to get that bonus die. So it works always. It just matters on the narration. It's not the kind of game where it codifies thing, where a three is 3,000 pounds. A three is medium, whatever medium means in the scale you're playing it. Yeah, now as someone who's been reading super books kind of nonstop now for weeks, this <laughs> is a common concern that's handled very differently in many systems. But the root problem becomes the same. It's easy to handle the average thug or the cosmic class, you know, whether, mm -hmm. it's, whether it's beating up a punk or smashing a meteor. Those are actually really easy to deal with. But when you put them together, mm -hmm. that's when things get crunchy. And that's why something like Mutants and Masterminds is such a crunchy game because it has managed to handle that whole scale from Ant-Man, you know, punching an ant at, at small size to a god smashing through solar systems um, yeah. all in one game. So, well... I, I, as I don't see a super setting out for Pip yet. No, I don't think it's something that it uh, can't handle. No, I agree completely. I, I don't see the any reason why it wouldn't. And it does handle that big scale because all the DM would have to do then is assign different difficulty dice depending on what character is taking the action. Right. So if the cosmic character is punching that thug, you just make an automatic success. Whereas if the the inner if the if you know Daredevil somehow up in space trying to stop a meteor, that's going to be every D six I have in my collection as a difficulty die, right? Like so, it definitely can work. Yep. Well, next up, Javier uh, Javier Javier Gonzalez commented on our Back to the Future Dice Through Time unboxing to say, "I have seen the rules of every Back to the Future, 
the card game out of time dice through time an adventure through time back in time Funkoverse strategy game hill valley etc and they have left a bad taste in my mouth i would like to create a game from scratch but i can't think of any ideas no matter how much i have researched i wanted to ask you do you know any game with mechanics or a game system related to back to the future mcfly against tannin all games are for children 10 plus years old not for adults well thanks for the comment javier uh from what i've heard the funko back in time game from prospero hall is the heaviest of the back to the future games released so far but it does look like you've tried that one already so i now i personally wouldn't call these kids games to me these are on the lighter side i would call them family weight games games that you could play with kids but are supposed to be fun for the whole family uh by putting 10 plus on the box almost every board game i own is 10 or 13 plus so i don't think saying 10 plus makes it a kid's game but i get it if you want something harder these are definitely on the lighter side though to me i'm happy to see them because these are way heavier than the license back to the future games i remember growing up with where roll and move and move a cardboard standy at this point, though, I think this is all we got. I think you're stuck. Um, this is probably the best you're going to get for Back to the Future games as far as weight, especially being family movies, so they want the whole family to be able to play. Now, I do have a feeling you're not going to see anything else heavier, but what I would love to see, and I don't know, I personally find these at least challenging, is a Coded Chronicles game with Back to the Future. I think that would be fantastic. To me, that's a missed opportunity right now because I know one of the companies with the Back to the Future license has put out other games, so... Come on, let's get a Coded Chronicles together. Yeah, that could be uh, that would be a complex one to write the the, the with, with time, time travel traveling. And, oh yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be uh, the Bamboozle Bros trying to put those books together, but <laughs> it would be a uh, good deal. All right. Well, on a much more positive note, at Peak Hope left this comment on our Pathfinder Adventure card game review on YouTube. That was a really in-depth explanation of the game well done i agree that the learning curve is steep and that card font is tiny it's a le it's a clean font with good contrast but it is tiny now to answer your question about why you would use hero points for rerolls, you're only allowed to take one skill feat one power feat and one card feat per level since there are four scenarios per level you'll end up with one hero point per level that you'll either save to resurrect or spend for a reroll. The dragons demand a short adventure path ends kind of abruptly, which is unfortunate. You'll need to play Curse of the Crimson Throne to get the full experience. Well, thanks so much for the uh, the comment, Peak Hope. I got I'm amused by our, our most positive comment coming from someone with the username Peak Hope. Something about that is just fitting. I, I I'm gonna have to double check the rule book. I honestly don't remember anything about limits per level, but you know what I mentioned in the game? That is one thick, dense rule book. So it's I'm not shocked to learn that we probably missed something. So yeah, that makes sense. Um if you're gonna have it, you might as well use it for rerolls, right? If, if you're limited on those. Um I the, I'm gonna have to check too, because I actually think I might have taken two ability upgrades already with my second advance. I can't remember. I might have increased my deck. But I'm going to have to double check that, double check the rules. And just as a note, we do own Curse of the Crimson Throne. So we're still haven't quite, we haven't gotten back to Dragon Command. And then fortunately, I keep, I'm sure Deanna is, is dying to play it again, but I've been forcing her to play new games so we can talk about it on this dang podcast. We haven't gotten back to it, but yeah, I do have the next step. And I, I, and I'm doing a review of it once we actually get to it. Well, let's finish off with a comment from one of our regulars, Chris Groff. In regards to our best of 2020 list from a couple of weeks back, mm -hmm. I've heard of many of those, but only played code names concept. My favorite played games of this year are mostly just games from previous years. Mm -hmm. I have a few new expansions though. For me, this year was kind of a drought. Well, thanks as always for the comments, Chris. I love seeing Chris respond to our stuff. Uh, 2020 was definitely an interesting year for getting to try new games for most of us. Um, the big reason for me, at least, um, was the lack of con season, right? Right. There, there was no way to demo the new hotness. And this is the reason when we did do this episode, instead of doing a best of 2020, we did best new discoveries of 2020 because there was a lot of games we played that were from previous years. And we didn't get to try a lot of the, the, the new hotness from 2020. And you know what? There, there's not gathering with people. There's not being able to get together with cons. And as Chris pointed out, as this, this thread continued, 
there was less games released. There was obvious manufacturing delays in China and shipping issues and all kinds of other reasons that just less games came out compared to previous years. So there was less to choose from. Now, Chris did know he just didn't find anything to get excited about. You know what? That happens. And, and to be honest, for the amount of games I want, I'm glad actually that 2020 was a little, you know, like I, I don't feel I'm behind. Whereas there's still 2019 games I feel I still have to try. I don't feel like I missed out on anything, which I actually kind of appreciate. I like that feeling of I kind of feel caught up on what's coming out right now. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question from patron Brian Sheen, who wrote, My question was prompted by a comment Sean some time ago regarding historical games. Being a longtime historical miniature gamer, what historical-themed board games would you recommend for those of us used to a more complex game experience? Well, thank you very much for the comment, Brian, and for being one of our hotel guest Patreon patrons. I hope we got the name right this time, Sheehan. I think that's right. Well, practice makes perfect, especially with some helpful pokes in Discord to let us know we got it wrong. Yeah, we do apologize for our pronunciation names. Please feel free to correct us. Now, I know Brian is the secretary of the Northwest Historical Miniature Gaming Society. This is a group that and takes very historic miniature gaming and everything that goes with that from the recreationist rules to the miniature painting and scenery building and all those aspects. Now, I'll admit this is an aspect of the tabletop hobby that I have not really gotten into myself. Now, I have played a number of miniature games over the years. I do enjoy painting, building miniatures, as well as scenery. I've always stuck with fantasy and sci-fi themes and, well, lighter rule sets and none of the real simulationist type stuff. Now, I do hold a lot of respect, though, for people who play historical games, especially those with an eye to accuracy and simulation. Indeed, it's a hobby that can really take in a lot of different specialities, not only gaming, but with model making, painting, and researching aspects. In some ways, it reminds me of the same sort of mindset that gets people into the SCA or uh, historical battle recreations uh, out in the fields, you know, the actual uh, mm -hmm. people who take part in live recreations just on a different physical scale. Yeah, I totally agree. Actually, one of the, the local gamers, no longer local, was part of recreation of um, War of 1812 stuff out at Fort Malden. Was also a Tyranid player at Warhammer 40k. So I think there is some overlap for the with the recreationists and the hobbyists. Now, where I don't have a lot of historical miniature gaming experience, I do think I have a pretty good amount of historical board gaming experience. And that works out well, since that's what Brian's looking for tonight. Now, note, I am not going to be talking about Hex Encounter chip-based war games tonight. Hex Encounter war gaming is a genre of games all on its own, in my opinion, and one I have even less experience with in miniature gaming. Games like Advanced Squad Leader, the standard combat series from Miniature Men Press, Combat Commander, SPQR from GMT Games. There are thousands of these out there. I personally don't know enough about these games to actually make any recommendations here. So what I will be talking about are the more traditional hobby board games, uh, your Euro games, some of your Meritrash games, and some war games. Like some of these have war game roots. None of these involve figuring out ratios, counting your chip stats, and having to look up things on combat tables. Right. If your game requires a three ring binder or a spreadsheet, we probably won't be covering it here tonight. The one exception are the train games may actually fall in there somewhat. That's about as close as we get. So my number one recommendation, now this is based on personal experience, the games I've had the most fun with is the Command and Colors series of games. These are all written by one man, Richard Borg, and there are a number of these set at different time periods with varying amounts of historical accuracy. Now on the heavier end of things, we're going to stick to, so that's what Brian was looking for, is the, the, the more epic engaging games. Uh, your best bet is going to be looking at the ones that specifically say Command and Colors on the box. So like there are like Battle Cry is a Command and Colors game set during the Civil War. I'm not talking about that one. Not that that's a terrible game, but I'm looking for the ones that specifically say Command and Colors. Those are Command and Colors Ancients, Command and Colors Napoleonics, Command and Colors Medieval, and Command and Colors Samurai Battles specifically. 
All of these use blocks on a hex map to represent units. The blocks are two-sided, like there's no fog of war or anything, it just blocks represent your minis, so way simpler than having to paint anything. And you have groups of blocks, and as units are destroyed, you remove them. And it uses a really unique card-driven mechanic, which is the command system, where your board is divided into three zones. You have a center and left and right flanks, and you're going to play cards that say things like, use two units on the right flank or activate one unit per, per area, or activate three units on the flank, and then the units are color-coded, usually red, blue, and green, and it might say activate your green units, activate your red units, activate your blue units, and the combat dice have those colors on them. Now, some games mean if you roll the color of the unit you're attacking with, you hit. Other ones are if you roll the unit you're trying to hit, you hit, and so on, but they're all variations of the same scene. Big hexes, lots of blocks, card driven with some dice resolution system and that was the command and color series of games up next i have a series of games that also use blocks this is the columbia block games these are from a number of distant designers and these again have wooden blocks on a map but they're very different from the command and color series for one some are hex based but most are root maps where you have points with lines Dividing them, usually cities and roads, but it depends on the particular game you're playing. What these feature is a fog of war. This is created by having unit information only on one side of each block, and you play with your blocks facing you and the opponent's blocks facing the other. Actually, um, for a mass market version, think Stratego, but on a higher level. In addition to having the stats on all one side, the stats on the blocks change during the game, which is represented by rotating the blocks 90 degrees. Normally, it's a matter of your units come out at full strength, and every time they take damage, you rotate them clockwise 90 degrees, and their stats change. Though some of the games do have rules for reinforcements and uh, merging units, and in that case, you turn counterclockwise. The two most well-known Columbia block games, historically speaking, because I do do some fantasy as well, my favorite being Hammer of the Scots, which does the whole um, Britain versus William Wallace Braveheart thing, um, and Julius Caesar which does the whole Julius Caesar versus Pompey Roman thing. And those are the Columbia block games. It's sticking with the war game theme. Next, I have the Birth of series from Academy Games. Again, uh, there's a few different designers on this one, but they're all published by the same publisher, Academy Games. These are what we call folk on a map games or cube on a map games. These have the birth of america series was the first series they put out they include three games 1754 conquest 1775 rebellion and my personal favorite 1812 invasion of canada these there's also a new series that they released just starting off uh, i think it's 2018 might be 2019 the birth of europe series has launched but so far they've only put out the first game in the series it's 878 vikings no, 878 Vikings did change them from, they always called these cubes on a map games. Well, 878 Vikings did switch them for little miniatures. Not the kind you want to paint, more just better representations than cubes, which just bugs me because I want to call them cubes on a map games, but technically they're no longer cubes. I love this series, um, especially a high player counts. Now, all of these games are team-based games. You always have two factions, but there are multiple players on each faction. And yes, you can play them two-player, but you don't get the full experience without having multiple players on each side, each controlling a different faction that's part of that side during whatever war is being recreated. This is another card-driven game, and this one is not about destroying the enemy units as much as holding Q points on the map. And generally, at the end of every round, you're going to get points for holding so many things on the map, or at the end of the game, the player that holds the most points on a map is going to win. So, for example, 1812, when the game ends, it's whoever owns more territory in the opponent's land than the other person who wins. There's actually a really unique mechanic for the way the game ends in this, where you have to play the cards in your hands, and one of those cards eventually is going to be a peace card, and once all players on one side call for peace, the game ends, and a true, because that's how most actual wars end up ending. What I like about it, though, is sometimes you're forced to do it, because it's the only card you have left, even though you may be on the losing side. It's a really neat mechanic, also has a really neat initiative system where it randomizes who goes every turn, huge fan of the birth of series from academy games right and that was the birth of america and birth of europe series from academy games all right that's an awful lot of war and battles so we're gonna we're gonna move away from that and bring up a rather popular very heavy set of games 
that may just be what Brian's looking for if you want something more involved and deeper and almost a lifestyle style game, just like historical miniatures. And that is the 18XX series of train games. Now, as the name is implied, most of these games are set sometime during the 1800s, uh, the, the birth of the age of steam, right? The, the age of rail and robber barons. There are a ton of different 18XX games spread over various time periods, some more historically accurate than others. Each game has its own map and its own set of special rules, but it's all about owning stocks and various rail companies, upgrading those companies, buying trains and building routes. The winner of every Tingle 18XX game is the one that has the biggest, the best portfolio by the end of the game. The interesting thing here is no one owns a particular color or a particular train, unlike most Euro games or say even like, a, well, uh, uh, Ticket to Ride actually is a better example of an 18XX. So you don't own it. You have your own routes. But say like a Steam or something like that. In this case, it, you are buying stocks in the companies instead of playing one company. Right. And now if you, and for, for instance, on how involved these are, if you go to a con, if, if in-person cons happen again, 18XX jet, uh, games get their own rooms often mm -hmm. and, and people will lock themselves in there for hours at a time. Yes. And those are the 18XX series of train games. All right, back to the war theme, but this time cooled down quite a bit. We are going to talk about the one game that I'm sure everyone expected to find on this list tonight, and that is Twilight Struggle. Uh, this is a game that sat at the top of the Board Game Geek number one spot for almost 10 years. When I joined Board Game Geek in 2002, this was the number one game in the world. This is a two-player only card-driven area control game that is all about the U.S. and Russian Cold War and the space race happening at the same time. That's actually a big part of the game. Players are using cards to influence various factions around the world, various um, regions of the world, while trying to avoid mutual destruction through thermal nuclear war. Yes, that is a common outcome in a game of Twilight's Struggle. Uh, this is still considered by many people to be the best two-player board game ever made. Strong recommend checking this one out. And that is Twilight Struggle taking things a different look now i am not sure if you can consider these to be historical i'm gonna go with it because these are civilization building games because the good civilization building games do feature actual historic events monuments wonders technological advances and people in them so while you may not be following a historic timeline you're rearranging historic elements to build your own civilization while there are a number of good Civ games out there, including Sid Meier's Civilization, the modern version, as well as the classic Avalon Hill Civilization and Advanced Civilization, my personal favorite is much more modern, and that is Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. This is a card-driven brain burner of a game that will take multiple plays to master. Once you do, though, it is a fantastic experience. Now, I know some people that want a Civ game to have a map and exploration in it, so don't like Through the Ages or Nations, another card game. If you do really have to have those like miniatures and moving and building buildings and physically that, that, that aspect of it, where you're flipping over map tiles, then take a look at Clash of Cultures. And that was civilization building games like Through the Ages and Clash of Cultures. And Through the Ages is definitely up there on the uh, the weight. I don't even know what its uh, board game weight is. I haven't actually checked. I mean, but I guess I, like a 3.8, but uh, I'm not, yeah, I don't know offhand. It is a, a, a hunk of a card game that, that really, yeah. We, we need gotta to play a few yeah, times. We should, we, even, even playing a few times, it takes, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of aspects to that one. All right, this one is going to be a catch-all. I, I wasn't sure a good way to list these games together, and I'm not quite sure if these are going to be quite what Brian's looking for, but I'm going to call this section Gaming the Renaissance because there are a number of very solid Euro games set during the Renaissance based on various historical events and families. Uh, some of the best include the Princes of Florence, where you are building a dynasty like the Borgia or the Medici. Uh, you can play merchants and traders in the city of Genoa, or Coimbra for the older one. The other ones were a little older. Uh, Coimbra is a much more modern game set in the 15th, 16th century Portugal. This uses multi-use dice mechanic that is really well done. 
or Lorenzo Il Magnifico from Cool Mini or Not is a very popular one that was just released last year. There are tons of these Renaissance themed games. Like we could probably do a best Renaissance games episode and talk about which are more historic or not. So again, these range on the heavy scale. These are all, all midweight or heavier, but may not be the big epic game that Brian's looking for, or might just be what is perfect for his game night. And those were Euro games set during the Renaissance period. And I, I just hope Lorenzo Il Magnifico is better in person than it was it's supposed digitally. to be amazing because digitally it was a <laughs> tragedy. Yeah, it's supposed to be amazing. I'll admit I have not played that one. All right. Uh, this one wasn't on my list until about two hours before the show when Deanna was like, did you put this on the list? Did you put that on the list? Did you put this on the list? And then I got to give her thanks because she's the one that likes the heavier Euro games. And what she brought up were all the non-Renaissance Euro style games that we own that are fantastic. Um, these go from like Catan. Settlers of Catan, everyone knows and will love. There are a number of historical scenarios that were put out. One where you're building the pyramids of Cheop, or another where you're following the travels of Alexander the Great. Uh, Deanna's favorite game at the time, for a long time, may still be, I have to check with her, is Trajan, which is a Roman-themed game where you were playing the Emperor Trajan, or Tribune or Carpe Diem from Stefan Feld. They're all Roman-themed games. It doesn't have to always be so military either. For example, Arkwright is based on the invention of automation in the automotion, or sorry, automation industry and the build of industry in the U.S. with the invention of the spinning jenny. Lisboa is all about the fires in Portugal and rebuilding after those. There are so many great historic Euro games. Again, this could probably be a standalone topic. And I got to say, Brian, if you're looking for specific recommendations, hit me up on the Discord and I can probably give you specific ones. But there's just far too many for us to list them all here. Those are other Euro games with historic <laughs> themes. That's, that's actually not that terrible a taste to break because um, I only have one more section I want to talk about. These just to, to get something different, I wanted to feature a couple of cooperative games. Now, these, to me, are pretty much the complete opposite of a two-sided historical miniature battle, where you're at each other's throats and rolling hundreds of dice and trying to conquer the enemy. Uh, so this might be an interesting twist, something different for Brian to try out, something completely on the other side of gaming, uh, and that's cooperative historical games. So the number one most well-known, most referenced historical cooperative game would be freedom the underground railroad this is from academy games which we mentioned before uh this is a game which one to four players are working with the abol abolitionist movement to help bring an end to slavery in the united states this is a multi award-winning game a ridiculous number of awards that is now being used in history classes in schools like when you purchase this game, if you buy it at least from Academy Games, you can even order the teaching guide to go with the game so that you can get all the background information and how to best use the game to teach yourself and others about history. Now, the second cooperative game I want to list tonight is The Grizzled. Uh, this is a little lighter than the rest of the games on the list. This is a hand management card game all about trying to survive in the trenches of World War I. This is a brutal but enjoyable co-op experience that similar to Freedom the Underground Railroad won a slew of awards for innovation, gameplay, and thematic elements. Now, for that one in particular, if you are looking for the Grizzled, I do recommend trying to find the newer Armistice Edition, um, which adds a campaign element and does offer more of a sliding difficulty scale because the original game can be brutally hard. So you start off a little easier to get used to the game and getting your group used to playing it before you ramp up the difficulty. Plus, as pre-painted miniatures, it looked really cool. Well, well, those were two historical cooperative games Freedom, the Underground Railroad, and The Grizzled. All right, before we stop in and check with the lobby to see if they have anything, I do have three honorable mentions I want to highlight. Now, from what I saw online doing research for this topic, these are three of the most popular historical games out there. And the only reason they're on the list is I haven't played any of them. I don't know much about them. I don't own them. Now, I will admit, I have not played my copy of Freedom of the Underground Railroad, but I have read, at least read the rules, so I'm familiar with the game and I can see it's writing. These I know very little about. Just while doing research today, they popped up on multiple people's lists. The first is The Founding Fathers. Players play the Founding Fathers of America, competing to be the father with the most renown at the end of the game. 
They do this by going through articles of the Constitution one at a time and using multi-use delegate cards either to vote, to use for special abilities, or to support their stance on a number of different issues in the game. I didn't deep dive this, but this sounds like a heavy one with a ton of built-in history. And that was Founding Fathers. John Company, this was the heavy cardboard game of the year last year. This game attempts to sell the 250-year story of the British East India Company, one of the most well-known and influential organizations in all of world history. While attempting to steer the company, players will attempt to amass power, prestige, and position. This is a meaty looking game like i brought this up on board game geek and the board intimidated me and that doesn't happen often like this is one of the busiest things i have ever seen and i'm not sure if it would fit on my eight by four table downstairs plus you're trying to recreate 250 years of of commercialism that's just nuts that that is an ambitious game plus edward a heavy cardboard i trust his recommendations for him to give it the golden elephant that is a huge accolade and that was john company all right, the last one I left on the list is because it is probably the most infamous historically based game on the planet. While I don't know if it fits Brian's requirement of a complex game experience, you won't find a historically themed negotiation game as cutthroat or infamous as Diplomacy. Uh, this game's reputation for ruining friendships is why I've never played it. I have heard so many nasty things about this game. I, I have no interest in ever trying it. I don't want to give it a shot, but you know what? Some The people who love it, love it. Well, that's it for our discussion on historically themed board games. We're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. Uh, I see Danielle mentioned uh, <laughs> Tokaido. Uh, I don't know. I, that's, yeah, that's historic. That's, technically, yeah. Th yeah. That fits those historic, um, the historic Euro game series. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have anything else that people think they should check out? I don't, I don't think our chat room's probably in the same position where they haven't played it that a lot. Many a lot of people games. real excited with some of your suggestions, some real love oh, for academy good. games out there. Apparently, 1812 is very, very expensive. There's something going on with academy games, you can't get 878 Vikings right now either. Oh, so interesting. I don't know what's going on if it's a, it's a worldwide pandemic thing if it's something else i honestly don't know um it looks like they might be doing a reprinting of all their games because i have now seen vikings with a new box size oh okay so i'm wondering if they might be doing another print run and changing it interesting so i i am not positive don't pay that much for invasion of canada like it's good but pfft. right so Jeff is knowing if he had a partner or four for Invasion of Canada, I play. I will happily play that with you once this is done. Um, yeah, the, the thing is, there are a lot of lighter games, right? So he did ask for complex side, so I tried to go with the heavier yep. games. So like uh, Danielle is noting, Guillotine is a is a nice historically <laughs> themed game, but yeah, that's a lighter one, one yep. that maybe they need to bring back. Yep. And uh, Angie Games, she is not recommending Roman Bingo. Yes, Rise of Augustus. Bastille, that's a good one. There's a there's a good Euro with a, a good historic theme. That was actually, that that's still one of the biggest hidden gems of 2020. Although I think it came out in 2019. Hidden gem <laughs> for us in 2020. Right. Actually, I got it in 2019 because that was, a, I'm getting messed up with what year it is anymore. Yeah, quarantine. Like, quarantine. I was messed up on months. <laughs> now I don't even know what year it is. There yeah. are so many, like what actually happened earlier today is, um, we, we have been just putting out the review games in my pack drop here. For those of you who are listening to the podcast, when I record the show, we have a, our office and I have a table back there and we pile up the games that we're talking about. Well, I've had there for the last few weeks of so the review games are like, oh, we really should have piled up the games we're going to recommend. So then Deanna goes downstairs she's like, oh, you got Trajan, you got this, this. And I'm like, no, no, no. Oh, those are good. <laughs> oh, Quebec. That's another one we thought of. So Quebec is a game about building the city of Quebec that has a really unique um, system where there's four different aspects of the government and politics, and I, it, this shows how long it's been. And you put influence cubes in them, but then they cascade to the next section. So if you don't win the first section, they cascade to the next one. If they don't win that, they cascade. That one's really neat. So Quebec's another recommendation for, again, the Euro style. Right. Um, but yeah, not a lot from our chat, which is fair. Uh, hopefully we just gave them a whole bunch of games to try out which is totally fair. 
maybe we just did our research this time. <laughs> I know I've I've play tested a uh, a historical Canadian game based on uh, an, a, a hist- famous historical Canadian election, but oh, uh, that's that one's still just in play testing uh, locally here in Hamilton. Uh, there are quite a few other um, historic U.S. politics games that, that came up on other people's lists, but not being American, I don't care. <laughs> like there, there, there. I don't. Even, there's one called Making of the President, and then there's there's one about the the Nixon administration. And it's just not my thing. Whereas the Cold War is something I definitely lived through, so I understand when I get a Cuban Missile Crisis what car, what that card's about, or the War on Drugs. Right. Oh, absolutely. All right. Many people have asked us, what are great games you can bring to work or school to play on a lunch break? Today we look at one of those, Scora, from Inside the Box Games, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this filler game. Alright, Scora was designed by Rory Muldoon and Rose Atkinson. It features some really striking art by Rory Muldoon himself. Published in 2020 by Inside the Box Games LLP, which is a limited partnership under their lunchbox games line now the card game score is a game of fishing and feuding but it's mostly about fishing it's a small card count lightning quick area majority game played over two rounds the first round players are playing catch cards onto the board which are divided into three fishing spots while placing some cards they're also going to add boats to the different regions once all cards are played, car- players will draft cards in order based on area majority using the boats. In addition, each card's worth points. The players also have a hidden scoring card they chose at the start of the game that they can use to earn bonus points. If you want to see what you can get in the lunchbox-sized box for Scora, check out our somewhat glitchy Scora unboxing video on YouTube. Yeah. I do apologize for the quality on this one, especially the part where the video breaks up when Mo is talking about the rule book. While we consider just not publishing, the rest of the video is good, and it really shows off the cards well. Yeah, I do apologize for that one. We don't know what happened with the original video. We had to download it from Twitch, and it didn't turn out as well as we'd hoped. I think Sean did his best he could trying to recover what he could. And I think it'll still figure it's better than nothing. At least you do get to see what is in the box for the most part. Now, the first thing I do want to know about Score is that box. Um, as Sean said, it's like it's lunchbox size. Like, it really is. It's meant to look like a small lunchbox. It's the right size. It even has artwork on the top for as a handle, which I didn't get at first. I was like, what's this supposed to be? And I'm like, oh, it's a lunchbox. I get it. Plus, it's very solid. Like, it's just a, a nice solid box that flips open from the front, which is held shut by a magnet. Now, inside the box, you'll find a short, easy to read and learn seven page rule book. Actually, only six pages are rules. This is the kind of game where you could sit down, open it up with players at the table and sit and learn the game together. This doesn't require a lot of prep ahead of time. Under that are some punch boards that hold the ocean board. This is a board divided into three um, segments and some axe tokens. These are nice and thick, like really significantly thick cardboard. There are six wooden boat tokens in four different player colors. These do also feature unique flag artwork, which I like because this will help out anyone who has any difficulty telling the colors apart. It does look like the colors are already colorblind friendly, but just in case, there's also the distinguishing feature of the flags to tell them apart. There are two sets of cards included with Scora, catch cards and decree cards. Uh, The decree cards are end game scoring cards. The catch cards feature three different suits. There's fish, claws, and sharks. And there are two different numbered cards for each suit. The numbers range from one to six, and there are four copies of each card included in the game. And that's it. Individual suits are distinguished by both color and iconography. Again, a thumbs up for accessibility there. Each card also features some pretty striking Viking-themed artwork and some additional game text. So how about you give us an overview of this fishing-themed game? All right, so you start a game by placing the ocean board in the center of the table between all the players. This has three areas divided into thirds, A, B, and C, and a spot for a row of cards to come off each area. Players start assembling their hand by collecting one of each of the catch cards numbered one, two, and three. That'll give them all three suits as well. Remaining cards numbered four to six are shuffled. One card gets placed face up in each section of the ocean, and then the rest are dealt out evenly to each player with any remaining cards removed from the game. 
Next, players get two randomly assigned decree cards. They pick one to keep and discard the other. These are endgame scoring cards that are going to give bonus points for things like having the majority of one of the three card types, having only caught two of the three types of catch cards, or having different creatures in your final catch and so on. So the Viking theme I'm feeling right now is pretty sketchy at best. Yeah, the Viking, the only thing Viking about this game is the artwork, really. So, yeah, so this is kind of why um, it, it's a unique take on Viking thing. Like, normally when you think Vikings, you're, you're thinking raiding, right? Or pillaging or, or capturing monasteries or invading England, not catching sharks, crabs, and fish. It's, it's definitely a, a unique take on the Viking theme. So once you get to the actual gameplay, it is broken into two distinct phases. First is the baiting phase, and then there's the fishing phase. During the baiting phase, each player will play one card to one of the three ocean areas. The card is played on top of any previously played cards in that area, making a row slowly going out from the ocean board. So you can always see the previous card. Each card features a catch type, uh, showing the suit of either fish, claws, or sharks, a point value from one to six, a creature type with an image and an action. As each card's played, you're going to carry out its action. Now, cards one through three have players add boats to the ocean location the card's played at. So if you play in the A row, you put boats in the A ocean. The four and five cards manipulate the cards already in the playing field, uh, moving one card from the location they're played at to an adjacent spot, so from A to B or C. Well, the six card actually doesn't do anything when you play it. It is worth six points cut bait or get out so if the card played matches the suit of the card it's placed on top of so you put a shark on a shark or a fish on a fish you also get to collect an axe token this is your supposed battling i guess after placing a card you also get the option to move one of your already played boats from one ocean spot to another once everyone has played all their cards going around the table the baiting phase ends and you move to the fishing phase so during the fishing phase are going to collect those catch cards that were played earlier. Shouldn't you catch collect cards? Collecting catch cards just seems wrong. Uh, they call <laughs> them catch cards. I'm surprised they're not called, I guess they can't call them fish cards because there's also sharks and crabs. I don't know. Catch cards is an interesting choice for it, but I think it's the overall all your cards are your catch. I don't, I don't know. The theming again here is a little rough. So you start with the A ocean area. Player with the most boats select one catch card collects it and keeps it till the end of the game and then they remove one of their boats then the second player the person who had the second most boats selects one card to take then the person with the third and the fourth most boats in the area this continues until all players have collected a card for each boat and then if a player runs out of boats they just can't collect any more cards and if the cards run out any leftover boats there are wasted by the players note that the order of card selection is set right at the beginning so it's not like it changes every time someone removes a boat. It doesn't alter. So once you've determined the order of control, the boats just show how many cards you're going to get to take. Now, if there is a tie for area majority, this is where the axes come in. The player with the most axe tokens wins the tie, but then they have to lose one of their axe tokens, which could affect a future tie because you could be tied at the A spot and then tied again at the B spot. If players are still tied for the number of axe tokens, the tie goes to the player earliest in turn order. Play continues like this, resolving each of the three ocean areas until everyone's collected all the cards they can. Now, special note with two players, when selecting a card to collect, you also pick a second card at that location to remove from the game. You continue the fishing round, drafting cards from each of the three oceans until all cards are gone or are claimed. And then once everyone's completed fishing, all you do is add up your catch cards. You just add up the number on the top right corners. Cards are worth victory points based on those numbers, and you're also going to score points if you manage to complete your decree card. Whoever has the most points wins. Now, for the record, since we're talking, we have mentioned the Viking theme. Scora in Old Norse means to mark, cut, or score, and has nothing at all to do with fishing, but counting up totals by scoring numbers, basically. Yeah, so the game is basically called victory points, uh, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> in Norse. <laughs> Um, so the thing with Scora, to, to get and understand this game, you have to realize what it is. So I think you need to know what the goal of inside the box 
games is trying to do with these lunchbox games. So the goal here is to have a number of small box games that you can literally bring to lunch, right? That's the point of the lunchbox games. They're quick to teach, easy to learn. They rely on tried, true, and tested game mechanics that most people are familiar with, making them very accessible to gamers and non-gamers alike. They take up small footprints. They don't require a lot of space. And they don't need like a dedicated gaming area to play. They play quickly to all playing in less than half an hour. When looked at in that light, Scora succeeds admirably. Now, while there are two other Lunchbox games lined up, neither are released yet. That's correct. This is the first one. And I got to say, if the others are any indication, I'm looking forward to seeing the other ones. Because besides being a great quick filler game, it looks fantastic. I love the aesthetic that Rory Muldoon went with. Like, there's where I think the, like, the Viking theme never shines through, but I appreciate it for how good looking the card art is. And I like the layout of the cards. Now, I will admit, there is one thing I would like to improve, and that would be to put the card point value on this, under the suit on the left-hand side, just because I'm a longtime card player. I want to fan my hand, and when fanning your hand, you can't see all the information you'd want. But you know what? Your largest hand size is playing two player with seven cards. And in a four player game, you're only playing with five. So it's not, it's not a big, it's not a problem. It just would have been nice. Now the quality of the components here is top notch. I've already noted how much I like the box. I was also impressed by the card quality. I don't know what they did for the finish on these, but it's way more matte than almost every other card I've seen, which makes them really easy to read both in hand and across the table, even with overhead lights, which is something I suffer with. This is really nice. Now, the cardboard is super thick. Both meeples are well-designed. They look neat. Um, I, again, I really appreciate the fact they put graphics on them for accessibility. Though my wife did think the purple one looks a bit like a t-shirt. And while the kids thought they were top hats the first time they played. I got to say, they do kind of all really, if you turn them upside down and hand them to someone out of context, I think a t-shirt is the first thing that someone's going to think of if they see that meeple. Yeah, I get it. I see it. You put them up the right side, I guess you see it. Especially you put them on the ocean with the waves, you get it. Still, they're nice pieces. It, it could have been cubes. I, I appreciate the fact it's not just cubes. So added to the game looking cool and being great for lunchtime, gameplay is also really solid. Now, what this reminds me of is the plethora of small card count filler games that came out probably in the last five years. I didn't actually look up. It might be 10 years now. I might be getting old here. But it became popular with Love Letter. Love Letter is so famous for being a card game that only has 13 cards in it. And a whole bunch of Love Letter isotopes came out after that. Well, Scora is similar to those. This game only features 24 cards, and you only use all 24 at the highest player count. You actually use even less if you're playing with less than four players. And this is a game all about counting cards and perfect to near perfect information. You always know what's out there, except if you're playing with four players or two players, there's always one card that's removed from the game. So other than that, you know every card in the game's out there except for that one card. So it's all about figuring out what cards your opponents have and trying to predict what they'll do with them. So not world-changing, but solid, which yeah. for a lunchtime game... Exactly. So where Scora went from good and solid to, yeah, it's okay, is two players. While the game works two players, it's using variant rules, and anyone who's a long-time listener of the show knows how we feel about variant rules for player counts. Uh, these rules mean that you're going to draft two cards instead of one every time. And what this meant is that in most games, players waste boats almost everywhere and only earn a small handful of scoring cards. Like four was about the max with your three was the average. And to be honest, it's an area majority game. And we've said it before, no area majority game really works well with two players. Because it's you have it or I have it, and that's it. And even with the tiebreaker, it just gives an, an advantage to the first player. Uh, unfortunately, perhaps, for people who don't eat lunch with more than one person. Yeah, especially with today's current state of the world, uh, lunchbox games may not be the best things to put out into the market. But I, overall, though, uh, this is a fast-playing filler with some really solid mechanics. Uh, limiting the number of the cards in the game means you have a really good idea of what's out there at all times, making the decisions in the game very tactical. Now, I personally prefer my area majority games to be on the longer and heavier side. I did find Scora had, did a good job of scratching that area majority itch. It comes in as a nice solid two weight. Yeah, that's significant for a half hour game or less. Now, where Scora signs is at doing exactly what it was designed to do. 
It's an accessible, quick-to-play game that still manages to have some meat on it. A game perfect for breaking out during a lunch break or as a starter or filler on game night. If you're looking for a game to fill that niche, Scora is a great choice. Now, if you are into heavier area majority games that you like are more complicated and longer, this probably isn't going to have enough depth to keep you interested, but it may be worth checking out because sometimes having something to fill the half hour gap of free time is just what you need. Well, be sure to check out our written review of Scora by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on reviews. And now, a look at Hall of Heroes, the first expansion for Raiders of the North Sea. Raiders of the North Sea Hall of Heroes was designed by the original designer of Raiders of the North Sea, Shem Phillips, and continues to feature the artwork of Mihailo Dimitrevsky, better known as the Miko. We are big Miko fans here. It was published in North America by Renegade Game Studio in partnership with Garfield Games in 2018. So this isn't the new hotness, but it's something we've been enjoying recently. This expansion adds a new section, the Mead Hall, to the main board of Raiders of the North Sea, along with new actions on that board. It adds a quest and reputation system, a new resource, Mead, and a number of new townsfolk cards, some featuring new abilities. In addition, it also includes the components to add a fifth player to the game and player boards that can be used at all player counts. Now, a copy of Raiders of the North Sea is required to use all this content, and it's also worth noting that unlike many board game expansions, this is not modular. You have to use everything in the box. You can't, for example, just add the new towns for cards and not use the new quests. Well, for a look at what you get in this expansion box, check out our Raiders of the North Sea unboxing video on YouTube. Now, a few things I want to note here. For one, you get this expansion, the box doesn't actually shut. It's in the shrink wrap and it's supposed to look like that. Uh, it's due to the fact the box is very full and the included punch boards don't actually fit when the lid is shut. Now, once you punch them, everything fits fine. And the publisher obviously decided it was better to ship it with the top not quite fitting instead of making a larger box just to fit all the extra cardboard. Honestly, it's rarely a bad sign when you see this nowadays. It means that they've really thought about the box contents and storage of the game. Hmm. I didn't want to compromise that and, you know, before the boards were punched. Yeah, I've seen this more. It seems to be being accepted more and more. After seeing the first couple of games that did this, people seemed a little upset, but it seems like people are accepting of this. So um, the eight pages of rules for the expansion are very clear. They were perfectly fine. Lots of examples. Three punch boards were well punched. Um, they have quest tiles, reputation tiles, and multiplier tiles. I do appreciate the multiplier tiles. Those are just in case you run out of gold or provisions, which isn't something that would happen at the normal player count, but at higher player counts, it's possible. Now, the thing that takes up the most space and weight in this box is the new Mead Hall board, along with six new player boards. There are one of these for each player. Now, note, this expansion makes the game go up to five, but this includes six. So to use that, you are going to need the, I don't know if it's a second or third expansion, but at least one more expansion for this game. Uh, there are also some wooden tokens. Most of the wooden here are going to be the new Mead tokens, and there is a whole new deck of 30 new citizens. So good quality components that fit in well with the original game quality-wise. Mm -hmm. So what is it we're going to be doing with all this new stuff? All right, so I mentioned one of the things this expansion does lets you play with five players. So this does require a slight rule change. This takes part during setup. Instead of just getting a random starting town folk, you introduce a drafting mechanic. You're now going to get five town folk card, pick one to hire for free. This is a big thing. And then pass two of your remaining cards, one to the left and one to the right. Now, the most interesting thing here is that the designer also suggests you use this variant with less players. Because what it does is that free card just start jump starts the game a little bit and cuts a bit of time off the overall game length. I think it's just interesting to see a bi-directional card pass like that, not right or left, but right and left with yeah. your cards. True. Next, we have the 30 new townsfolk cards. You just shuffle these in with the existing townsfolk. Many of these have new abilities, which, of course, listed in the rules. Now, what I like most in here is that there are new heroes. One of the complaints, I, I don't know complaint, but one of the, the idiosyncrasies of the original game is that there are only four heroes, or three heroes in the original deck, and it's a four-player game. So it always meant someone might be left out if you managed to get through the whole deck. Well, they fixed that. I think there's a total of six heroes now. Everyone can have a hero now. Next, we have the Mead rules. Now, Mead is earned in the Mead Hall, which I'll get to in a minute. 
as well as through some of the new townsfolk card actions. Any time when raiding, before rolling the dice, players can spend meat. Each meat gives the players one military strength for that raid only. Plus one strength for booze. Definitely a Viking game. Now the rest of the additions are tied to the new meat hall board. This you place under the main board. It's well designed so the art lines up. It just looks like the board's bigger. Actually, if I know, if I remember correctly, you can even get a neoprene version that has the, the board built in. On it are spots for three townsfolk cards and four reputation tiles. This board has one black worker placement spot that allows players to pick from two actions. The first is Charm the Crowd. You select one of the townsfolk cards that are on the hall board, add it to your hand. You also collect any coins or mead shown on the board above this recruited Viking. The second action is complete a quest. This is the most complicated part of this expansion. With Hall of Heroes, any time a player completes a raid on the main board, this is the main thing you're doing in the main game, after taking the plunder from the raided location, you're now going to place one of the new quest tokens randomly from that onto that spot. Now, each quest shows a required military strength. That's the red number for people who know the game but don't know all the special terms. Um, and shows a picture denoting the quest type. There are three different types and list rewards earned for completing the quest. So the way this works is when someone takes the completed quest action on the mead hall, you're going to pick one of the quests on the board to complete. And you're going to discard town folk from your hand. Note these aren't the ones in your raiding party on the board, but one's still in your hand. And you have to discard an amount equal to the military strength or higher of the quest tile. Note all of this military strength has to come from the cards. You can't use mead here and you don't get to add your armor level that you built up during the rest of the game. Now, once a quest is completed, you're going to get the rewards in the quest. You're going to place the quest on the top of the new player boards. Now, if you complete three quests of the same type, you earn reputation for being good at that quest type, and you take one of those four reputation tiles from the meat hall. Note, these aren't replaced, so the only four max can be earned, and players can earn more than one. Each of these gives a one-time bonus. These can be things like play a townsfolk for free or so on. Earned reputation cards are also placed at the top of the new player board. Now, that player board at the top has a row of victory points similar to the Valkyrie track on the main board. And depending on how many tiles you put up there, you're going to get various points up to a maximum of 16 points for collecting 10 tiles. Now, all the other rules and Raiders of the North Sea still apply. There are no changes except for that drafting thing at the beginning. The other worker placement spots work all the same. The end game conditions remained unchanged. And the military, or sorry, and the scoring is exactly the same with the addition of that new reputation track. So this expansion really focuses on adding more as opposed yeah. to changing existing. As good, good expansions, I feel, should when you get the base game right the first time. Yeah, that is, that's a good description of what it does to this game. It, does, it adds breadth to the game instead of depth, I guess. You are getting more options. So the first thing I thought when I got this expansion was I knew it. Because when I played Raiders of the North Sea, the spot you put the plunder for all the raids is a very distinct shape. It's this, like, not quite a rectangle. And I'm like, there's got to be a reason they use that shape. Well, this is it. Because this is the quest tiles fit in those spots. I knew there was going to be a thing. I knew there would be something. Now, I'm not saying this is a, a good or a bad thing. But obviously, when Shem Phillips designed the game, he either already had this expansion planned or in mind. Or at least had been planning to put it out. Which I know that frustrates some people because they feel like they just got an incomplete game with the base game. But I've never felt my Raiders of the North Sea experience was incomplete. So I just think it's a thing. I don't have a problem with it. Now, talking about those plunder spots, let's start off with the new quest system. So that's the biggest part of this expansion. Personally, I like it. I like it a lot. I like that something else happens after a location is raided. Something that gives all the players more options now. And I also like that the more raiding that happens, the more quests that pop up, giving everyone in the game more ways to work towards getting victory points. Plus, it also adds a new mechanic of now playing cards from your hands, which adds another use to every townsfolk, because already your townsfolk could be played as an action or played into your raiding party. Well, now they can also be kept to complete quests. I like that you're adding a third use to all the cards. Personally, I like having more options like this, right? I'm a Stefan Feld fan. I like point salad. So throwing that in, I thought was a bonus. I greatly enjoyed the addition of the quests. The problem is, though, is that this now takes away from the theme of the game, which is raiding. Like the game's called Raiders of the North Sea. You're supposed to be playing raiders. Now it is totally possible 
to play Raiders of the North Sea and never actually go raiding with your Vikings. Now, we did find over multiple plays this may not be the most viable strategy. It is one I have seen win the game if no one does anything to stop it. Now, some people I played with, I won't mention any names, did not like this new addition of the game and just felt it watered down not only the theme of the game, but just the tightness of the base game. That it was gather stuff, go raid, gather stuff, go raid. Now it's gather stuff, go raid, maybe do a quest, maybe go get some mead to level up. It, it just kind of watered down the overall experience. And it is interesting that an expansion specifically called Hall of Heroes now while I was winning without the sort of martial prowess that Vikings would consider heroic. <laughs> no, but all these quests are martial. Remember, you are spending military strength to complete each of these quests. It's just you're not raiding. You are, I, f I forget the three quest types. So you're still, you're still spending martial strength. So it's still, still a Viking thing there. So I, I think it still fits. It's just not raiding. Now, the rest of the content in this expansion has had much more universal appeal for everyone I played it with. Everyone loves the way to re the new way to recruit town folk. Everyone I played the game with likes that they don't just have to go to the gatehouse and get random cards. Instead, they can see what's on the board. They can pick which heroes they want and get a reward for them. Now, there is a disadvantage to this because now you're opposed to what cards you have, but you get that clean need as a, as a counteraction for that penalty of your opponents knowing what you have plus if you're playing with inexperienced players they're not going to care what cards you have anyway but when playing with experienced players it's good to know that oh you just drafted a grave digger so i know you're probably going to do this now the mead resource has also proven to be really popular uh what i've seen is people like to be able to stock up and then use them to score big in raids that they would otherwise would be risky based on your current military strength and armor value this also has a side effect that we found of speeding up the game slightly as players were able to complete the larger, more difficult raids earlier in the game. And what we found since adding Hall of Heroes is that most games now end because there's only one fortress left on the board, as opposed to the offering pile running out or running out of Valkyries. Well, who doesn't like mead, am I right? Now, one expression of this expansion I did not really enjoy was the five-player aspect. Over multiple plays, I had already decided that my favorite player count for Raiders of the North Sea was three. The expansion didn't change that. I still think, even with the expansion, three is better. When playing with four players, there can be a bit more downtime than I would like due to AP, analysis, paralysis. And this is worse now, right? This is just exasperated with the new play options because now you have many more things you can do in Hall of Heroes. And then once you get up to five players, it becomes even more time between turns. Now, I will note, I do prefer four players with Hall of Heroes over four players with the base game. Uh, due to the fact that competition for raiding spot gets very cutthroat with four players in the base game. Whereas now, if it's too cutthroat, you can kind of sit back and do quests instead, right? So if you're like, oh, all of the, I can't remember, monasteries are gone, I'm screwed you're like no you're not because now you can do the quest that were opened up the monastery so uh, hall of heroes does make the four player experience better but overall i still think i'd rather play with three regarding hall of heroes you know as a whole i really like it i i like the new gameplay elements i like the the new quests i like the renown i like everything that's added but this hasn't been the case with everyone i played with well, everyone loves having more town folk to pick from and ways to recruit them, and they love the mead thing and the way that affects the game. Not everyone enjoys the quest and reputation system. What I didn't feel was needed at all was the ability to play with five players, though I understand many game groups push publishing companies for higher player counts in their games. That's definitely a, a direction that every company is supposed to. We want to play with five, we want to play with six, we want to play with seven. Personally, at that point, I say split your group and play two different games, but I get it, wanting to keep everyone together in the same game. I personally can't recommend this at five. Well, I wonder if, given your concerns on time and analysis paralysis, if the game might be a solid turn-based online play at the higher counts. I could see it. Just uh, it, but One of the things I like about Raiders is how quick it is. Like, it's like an hour to finish a full game with the expansion, maybe an hour and a half. And I just, I, I feel drawing it out might have the problem we've had playing other games online where you kind of forget what you were trying to do. Especially in this one where you're collecting plunder or Vikings or uh, gold to hire more Vikings and trying to remember where you were going to raid. So I don't know. I, I Lots, think lots is... of notes, which is one thing we're bad yeah. at on BGA. But yes. there are, there you should, we should be keeping notes 
especially on a game like this with this sort of complexity uh, online. Yeah. No, I agree. And and I know there is a really, I think it's Steam version of this game I've heard really good things about, but I haven't tried it myself. I don't think it's on like Board Game Arena or Bois de Jou or any of those. Mm. I think it's Steam only and you'd have to buy it. And I've heard it's great, but I heard they, they spend a lot of time making it look pretty and sometimes that interferes with the gameplay. Right. have not played it myself, not my opinion. So what all this means to me is that Hall of Heroes is definitely a try before you buy. If you like Rage, I, personally, I say go buy it. It's awesome. But I've played with people who are like, yeah, I'd rather just play the base game. So because of that, try it first. Me, I tried it. I'd go buy it. I, I loved it. But not everyone's going to. Due to the fact this expansion is not modular, you're stuck, right? Like, if you add it, you're adding it all. So you can't just, like, oh, I like the new townsfolk. No, because a bunch of the new townsfolk give you mead, and a bunch of other townsfolk give you quest bonuses, and other ones help you with renown. You kind of have to use everything. So it's going to be worth seeing if your group is in favor of the broader gameplay options Hall of Hero Act offers before picking it up. So if you enjoy Raiders of the North Sea, take a look at Hall of Heroes. If you like, you know, point salads and games with more options, if what we've described tonight sounds good, maybe consider picking it up. But I do recommend trying it because not everyone is in favor of adding this game, this expansion to Raiders of the North Sea. Be sure to also check out Mo's written reviews of both Raiders of the North Sea and the Hall of Heroes expansion by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on reviews. And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at games we've played since last episode. All right, so one of the traditions we have in our household here is we like to celebrate the end of the year and start of a new year by uh, gaming in the new year, we like to call it. Uh, usually, we have a gaming in the new year party where I invite a bunch of friends over, and it usually goes for about 24 hours, if not longer. Uh, while we couldn't have a big party this year, we did end up playing some games on New Year's Eve with the kids, and this was the first year we actually let them both stay up till midnight for the first time, and that was a big deal to them. Uh, I went to bed around 11, and the kids stayed up, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Definitely a slower New Year for Sean. So the game we all played together was uh, the next book in Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle. For those of you who've been turning in, tuning in the last few weeks, have been hearing about this one. Uh, since it was a special occasion, the kids actually got dressed up for this. Uh, they went upstairs and found their official Harry Potter robes. And then uh, later, Grace actually brought down, she's got a Professor McGonagall hat. So she swapped that. She swapped to her hat because she wanted to be McGonagall instead of just a student. But fair enough. They, they actually put on their cosplay. So that was kind of neat. Um, I'm happy to report that we were able to vanquish he who shall not be named after a bit after midnight on January 1st, 2021. So I'm, I'm hoping that's a good sign of things to come for this year. I, I thought it was an appropriate way to start the year. So this was our first time playing book five and finally meeting and beating the main bad guy, the boss fight. Uh, this was our closest game in some time. It was definitely more difficult than previous ones. Um, number of us ended up stunned during this one, and uh, we did file through a couple locations. Definitely a different feel than our last few games. I got to say, I did find it particularly mean of the game to have you ramp up to three villains in the same game that they introduced the babe bad guy, especially because the last game could have easily introduced that third villain along with the dice. It just felt like that should have been two steps. Uh, if only it stopped there <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't know what we have to look forward to next but so after hogwarts battle was done and the kids were in bed uh d and i finished off i i this is not gaming but i gotta take a diversion just to complain a bit uh we finished off our craft heads brewery advent calendar well technically we bought the um deluxe version so it actually had something for all of the month going to new year's and the new year's beer was a version of ov like, like, I'm seriously thinking they're trolling people with this thing. Like, besides the fact they gave us kombucha and a sparkling something instead of beer, they started off the new with a craft brewery that made craft beer that's made to taste like one of Canada's most infamous mass marketed, probably most shamed beer in the world. I thought that was really strange. I don't know. OV of all the things to celebrate 2021. Maybe they were trying to make a comment on the previous year. <laughs> anyway, that's not gaming related. Um, what we were playing while drinking this beer was our shiny new copy of The Crew. Thanks again, Tech, for that one. Now, D and I played through the first six missions of The Crew using the included two-player rules. Now, I had heard some rather 
bad things about the two player rules and the crew. And I gotta say, like, maybe it's just a, a set of expectations. It wasn't bad. Now, what you do is you include a robot player named Jarvis, which is short for something. Now, this is done by laying out seven cards face down with seven more cards face up to represent Jarvis's hand. None of those cards are going to be rockets. It's all number cards. Then whoever's the captain controls Jarvis as if they're another player. So whoever the captain is decides, like, they get drafted to, they might have missions to complete. The, the captain plays Jarvis. It works. Um, with only two player, you know your cards. You know that between you and your opponent, or sorry, your partner, I should say, not opponent, you and your partner, you have the rockets, so you know who has which rockets, and you see half of Jarvis's cards, and then as you play them, you flip out to the ones underneath. So the game felt even more like a puzzle when playing with, with two as opposed to three or four players. Not surprising, but it's good to know that it wasn't as bad as it had been suggested it might be. Yeah, it was, it was significantly better. Now, what I didn't like about playing two players was that it wasn't the fact that you had Jarvis or a bot player, but it was the amount of fiddliness because of that bot. Because you start off, grab all the cards, find all the rockets, pull them out. Then you shuffle the deck and you make Jarvis's hand. So seven down, seven up. Then you take the rough rockets and shuffle them in. And you got to shuffle good because you don't want them grouped together, right? So you're trying to do an extra detailed shuffle. Then you're going to deal out the deck between the two players. Then you're going to grab the quest deck and you're going to shuffle that out and deal out whatever cards required for the mission. Like that's a lot of shuffling for what could end up being a really quick game round, like a game that could be over in one trick. If you happen to have a really bad starter hand, it really made me appreciate the work board game arena does in the background with card games like this. So I like the first round it was okay, but like by the sixth round, I was just like, okay, I'm getting a little sick of shuffling these cards. And sadly, board game arena doesn't seem to have the two player variant available for the crew which is a weird choice like i wonder why they omitted it it's not like it's more difficult programming i wouldn't think i don't know now my other minor complaint about this game is that there is a legacy aspect to this game more so than i thought now i knew there were 15 missions included in the game and when you play them on board game arena you play through them in order uh and actually it counts it as one game like until you end it you just keep going in order and you can jump ahead if you remember what number you were stuck at well while playing the crew you're actually before your first game supposed to open up this log book and log your crew where you write down every player's name and you make your crew manifest and then after each play you're supposed to tick off how many tries it took you and whether you use the call help from home communication thing for each puzzle then at the end, you add these up somehow and you actually get a score. Well, the problem with this is the game actually assumes you were playing the crew with the same group every week, the, the same crew. There's even, like, like I, I didn't expect that. And then there's only one copy of the book. Like, you write in the book, supposedly. Like, I, I just expected a scoring sheet or something. So, I don't know. I, like, if I want to start playing with the second group, now I need to come up with some alternative to record all this stuff. It was just something that I didn't realize was an aspect of the game, not having played the physical game until this weekend. Now, you say it's a book, but I mean, is it really that much more difficult than a scoring sheet and it's just in book form to make it fancy? Or Well, it's the rule book, the second half of it. And it's all okay. shiny and stuff. Like if you write in it, it's it's got a sense of permanency. Right. Now I have no idea. I'm sure on Board Game Arena someone created a PDF. I don't know if um Cosmos, I think, publishes this one. If Cosmos has something you can download. But like it's a distinct thing where you're checking off boxes and everything. It's not just like a nice sheet where you could just write it out. Now, sure enough, what we did was just Deanna opened a notepad file on her phone and started tracking it, which works. It just I hadn't as anticipated that aspect of the game that the designer actually expected you to play it with the same crew every game. So uh, mini score sheets, one page, uh, mini one page score sheets for the game that fit inside the box are available on yeah. board game arena. <laughs> See, that doesn't surprise me in the least. So overall, I wouldn't recommend picking up the crew as a two player game. If you're only ever going to play with two players, there's better two player card games out there. I like to be honest. I appreciate the fact that if you look at the box, it says three plus. And then notes, there is a two-player variant. I love the fact they called that out. But it's not terrible. Like, it, it wasn't bad. So if you feel like playing the crew and you only have two of you, it's worth playing. It's all right. We're probably going to choose other games next time. It's, it's more likely if I do want to play the crew now, I'm going to jump online and play with three until we can gather together and play with more people in person. Yeah. Well, sometimes any game at all is better than no game. But luckily with online gaming, we don't have to settle as much as we once did. Very true. 
Now, besides some scoreable two, three, and four player, uh, we already talked about that enough during the review section. Deanna and I also got a new card game, again meant for more players, uh, to the pl- to the table playing only two. This is a up to six player party game, Letter Jam from Czech Games Edition. So again, this is a game. This doesn't necessarily have a two player variant, but it does play less. Um, this is a cooperative word based party game. That reminds me most of Hanabi, because this is one of those games where you play not being able to see your own cards. Well, in this one, card one at a time, but you don't get to see what you have. So each game of Letter Jam, you're going to make a five-letter word out of cards, shuffle it, and pass them to the player on your left. The player doesn't look at these. They just lay them out in front of them, one, two, three, four, five, and then flip the first one up so that everyone else sees it instead of them. Now, if you're playing with less than six players, you're also going to stack create stacks of cards again displaying one letter so that every round players are looking at five letters facing them and then again if have one in front of them they can't see there's also a wild card that's added at the center of the table the players as a group then decide who's going to be the clue giver by trying to form words using these letters that they can see with the goal of getting the players to guess what letters in front of them so guess letters like after you've, you've the clue givers given their clue and they, they they do this thing with chips and you figure out what the words are the player then goes okay i know what this letter is they place it face down and they put their next one up and you keep doing that going around with the dummy players if you use one of their letters it just gets discarded and a new random one's drawn there is a bonus if you go through the entire deck of the dummy players but again i'm not going to worry about those small details here so what the goal is at the end of the game that everyone has determined what those letters in front of them are and are able to form a word out of them Interestingly, it doesn't have to be the word that was passed to them. If everyone is more or less able to spell spell a word with their letters at the end, they more or less win. And I don't know why they say more or less, but that's right from the rule book. They like to say more or less win. So what is the point of forming the first word if it doesn't come back and that's not the word you need later? So what having that first word does is help you guess the letters you have. Mm -hmm. So if you know you have these four letters and you're not sure what the fifth is, you know it's a word. It's not just right. random letters. So you're looking at it going, well, D gave me these letters. I, that's either a T or a U. And if I use it as a T, I can spell it Q. But if I use it as a U, I can't spell anything. It must be a T. So there is, it, it's just that it had to be a word. That oh, you're it's just, so it's just proving that it's a word. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now there's some extra stuff. Like you can actually add letters. And if you're not sure what a word is, you can use the wild card. There's a little more to it. Actually, there's quite a bit more to the game overall because there's rules for the kinds of clues you can give, what you're allowed to discuss openly and what you can't. There's a limit to the number of clues that can be given in a set game. And if you don't solve it by then, you more or less lose. Um, There's also a thing that makes sure that players take turns giving clues so it's not always the same player giving clues and so on. So it sounds interesting enough. Though word games like that can suffer in ways other party games don't, when people get tired and drunk, which makes some party games sort of yes. excel, while the games that with that sort of complexity, not so much. Yeah, for a New Year's game, this is an early in the night game. This isn't a late at night game. Right. This is this is actually a surprisingly more brain burning than you would think because it's not exactly what you thought. Like I'd heard a lot of good things about this game, and there was quite a bit of it came out again this isn't us talking about the new hotness but i gotta say it's well deserved like this was a lot of fun like it's all about trying to pick words that are going to help your partner not or partners who play more players and it's not just about like spelling the biggest word or the most complicated word like for example deanna said you have a three-letter word the second letter is r and the third letter is m well i only word i could possibly come up with is arm and i don't think there's another word so I knew I had an A. So a clue like arm worked. Well, sorry, question mark RM worked. Whereas later in the game, we spelled some rather long words to try to get people to guess what they were. I gotta say, we both really enjoyed it. Um, Deanna was actually particularly impressed by it. She's like, oh, that was good, right? Like I got a pretty big thumbs up by her, which is again, rare for her to enjoy a co-op game. So that was cool to find. Now it played fine too. Like I was surprised. I didn't know if it would work fine with two and it did like i but i think it's going to be better with more especially there's some some additional rules about extra letters and bonus letters those don't come into play with two player games 
Well, and uh, I've just been reading RPGs and prepping for an online game of masks that, surprise, surprise, I, I, apparently I'm going to be running. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. I, Sean's going to be running an RPG. Yep. Is this another um, play by forum? Yeah, my uh, Discord. Yep. Cool. All right, well, uh, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Well, one of the things I mentioned last week is that I needed to get the good game publishing games unboxed, and we managed to get that one done. Excuse me. Sorry. I'm going to start over because I, <laughs> I don't know. Carbonated coffee all of a sudden. <laughs> Give me a second here. <clears throat> Sorry about that. All right. Well, I said I was going to get those good games publishing games unboxed, and I managed to do that. Uh, we did an unboxing day. I don't even know what day of the week was, Sunday or so. And I got six games unboxed. Um, we got score and letter jam to the table, so that was cool. Up next is going to be reading rule books uh, for all these games that I've now opened. Um, so far, I've read the rules for Wonder Woman, Challenge of the Amazons, Fairy Season, and Trap Words. Now, Trap Words is not going to get played. Unfortunately, that one, there is no two-player variant, uh, not even three. This game requires four players minimum to play. And that's um, and it's not the kind of game GG is going to be able to play. So we're going to have to wait until lockdown's done before that one gets touched. So that one's going to be a while. I apologize, CGE. Uh, extenuating circumstances right now. Now, Fairy Season, that looks good. That is a ladder-based game where you are trying to play on top of the cards that are already in a pile following a certain order. So unlike a trick-taking game, I thought it would be trick-taking. It's a ladder game, and it looks good. It looks really neat. I'm looking forward to playing that soon. I think the kids are going to love it. Um, there are uh, some... Uh, th those are probably the big ones that are going to come up. I have no idea exactly what we're going to review next week. <laughs> But I do think what we're going to do is we have another question from a patron. And one of the benefits our Patreon patrons get is we do bump their questions up and try to get to them sooner rather than later. So we're going to get to another patron question next week where uh, Roger Mosh, uh, Windsor retired gamer, wants us to talk about engine building. Because he is really confused and points out that isn't every board game an engine builder. So I think we're going to sit down and try to describe the difference between earning points and engine building. So that'll be an interesting one. So what I want to do is what we've been trying to do is tie reviews into that, but I don't actually know what I have for engine builders in the pile. So we're going to have to sit down and look at the review list. We may or may not be able to tie those in. And there is always a chance we won't actually get the Rogers topic next week, but it is in the pile. It's on the list. It's going to get done soon, if not next week. Well, hopefully next weekend I can get a little more table time before the kids start back at school uh, physically. And uh, we'll see how that goes. If they do go back to school, I don't know. Locally, they're they're pushing everything out again. Yeah, but that's up to the local board to decide. Yeah, exactly. So. I we're we're a little concerned about the new variant, but yeah, yeah. <sighs> now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Brian Kurtz, great to see you in the Discord for a change. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Jeff Seuss. Thanks, Jeff. Kator, Cat and Tori. Thank you. Timothy Smith. Thank you, Timothy. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can find a, visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com and sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.